On the issue of the modern state of Israel and whether it does or does not fulfill specific prophecies, there are five perspectives on this issue. We'll deal with the first three perspectives in the introduction section of your outline. At the bottom of the first page, we'll deal with the fourth issue, and then we'll deal with the fifth issue, which is, I think, the biblical one. But the first perspective is that of replacement theology that began as early as the second century, and by the fourth century became a dominant position in the visible church. And in this first perspective, they would claim that the present Jewish state of Israel is simply an accent of history. Because when the Jewish people rejected, Yeshua rejected Jesus to be the Messiah. At that point, God took away all of the covenantal promises away from Israel and gave it to the church. Now even they realize the church is not fulfilling these prophecies in a literal sense, they go on to say, it was not intended to be understood literally, but rather symbolically. And therefore, the church has replaced Israel in its standing. And so there are no unfulfilled prophecies anymore. There's no future restoration of Israel in any biblical sense. And therefore, the modern Jewish state is nothing more than an accent of history. Now, the second perspective disagrees with the first one. It does believe that there is ultimately going to be a little fulfillment of all the covenantal promises made to Israel, all of the prophecies prophesied for Israel. And so they will point out that there will be an eventual uh, uh, fulfillment. However, they agree with the first view in the sense that the modern Jewish state does not seem to fulfill any prophecy, but sickly is also an accent of history and nothing more. Now, let's look at three prophecies uh, as an example of what they have difficulty with. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now chapters 29 and 30 make up one unit within the fifth book of Moses. In chapter 29, verse 1, notice these are the words of the covenant which Jehovah commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Horeb is a mountain range that contains Mount Sinai, and that is where the Mosaic covenant and the Mosaic law came into function. But this is now a distinct covenant from the one that was made at Mount Sinai. They're now on the east side of the Jordan River in the land of Moab. And at this point, he spells out the future. And she reads with chapter 29, he points out when the Jewish people entered the promised land, they'll fall into periods of disobedience. They'll fall into three different types of divine discipline. First of all will come subjugation, fulfilled in the days of the book of Judges. Secondly will come captivity, fulfilled by the Assyrian and then the Babylonian captivities. But then thirdly, there is a worldwide dispersion, which came as a direct result of rejecting the Messiah that was already prophesied within this book back in chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18. And so at this day, there's still more Jews outside the land than inside the land. However, keeping in mind that in the time that these books were written, there were no chapter divisions, there were no verse divisions. And so chapter 30 simply continues on from where chapter 29 left off. And in chapter 30, verse 1, it shall come to pass when all these things shall come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which has set before you, and you shall call them to mind among all the nations where them Jehovah your God has driven you, and shall return unto Jehovah your God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command you this day, you and your children, with all your heart and all your soul, that then Jehovah your God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you, and return and gather you from all the peoples with the Jehovah your God has scattered you. 
and if any of the outcasts be in the outermost parts of heaven, from thence shall Jehovah your God gather you, from thence he will fetch you. And Jehovah your God will bring you into the land which the fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will do you good and multiply you above all the fathers, and so on to the end of the chapter. But these verses point out that Israel will be scattered, as he pointed out at the end of chapter 29, but eventually there will be, no matter where the Jews live, they'll come into a saving belief, a saving faith, and then God will gather all of them from all over the world back into the land. And the modern Jewish state is, uh, does not fulfill a prophecy like this. And, what, and therefore, there must be some other understanding. So the second view agrees with the first one. The modern Jewish state is not a fulfillment of any prophecy. It's an accident of history. However, they disagree with the first view in that there will ultimately be a fulfillment of all these prophecies that have remained unfulfilled to this day. And then let's look at the second example, Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27, we'll be looking at verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 of chapter 27, it shall come to pass in that day that Jehovah will beat off his fruit from the flood of the river unto the brook of Egypt, and you shall be gathered one by one, all your children of Israel. The mention of the river is the Euphrates River, which functions as the northern border of the Promised Land. The brook of Egypt is often identified with the Nile River. That would be somewhat inaccurate because it would mean the Jews were already in the Promised Land before they left Egypt. But it's a reference to a, to a wadi in the central part of Sana, now called the Wadi El Arish. And that's the southern border of the Promised Land. And so one by one, every Jew will be gathered until every Jew is in the land. Then verse 13 says, It shall come to pass in that day that a great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come the ready to perish the land of Assyria, and they that are outcast the land of Egypt, and they shall worship Jehovah in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. And notice what is drawing the Jewish people is a spiritual sense of being able to come back to the land and to worship the God of Israel especially in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now, Zionism was mostly a secular movement, <coughs> mostly a secular movement, and, and it was not um, brought, it was, and Jewish people were mostly called to come to Israel to escape the persecution they suffer in different parts of the world and things of that nature. And it is, a, and um, the modern Jewish state was basically the responsibility of Zionism. In fact, in the early days of Zionism, Orthodox Judaism largely rejected it. However, after the events of World War II and the Holocaust, the majority of the Jewish population, both the secular and the religious, do support Israel's right to exist. Only one still negative to this are the ultra-Orthodox, the Hasidic movement, and so on, but mainline Judaism of, of different stripes supports the modern Jewish state. But it's not, they're not being drawn for spiritual reasons, but for other reasons of being able to escape the persecutions, different parts of the world. And so it's not a passage that the modern Jewish state doesn't seem to fulfill. Let's we'll look at the third example, and let's look to Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 39. The context begins in verse 25. We'll start our reading in verse 27. 27. When I brought them back from their peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, 
and they shall know that I am Jehovah their God, in that I caused them to go into captivity among the nations, and regather them unto their own land, and I will leave none of them there any more, neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I put out my spirit upon the house of Israel, says the Lord Jehovah. Here again we're seeing a regathering of a believing people upon whom the Spirit has been come upon and brought them to faith. And furthermore, the surrounding nations are welcoming them, whereas the surrounding nations largely in Israel, even to this day, have been rejecting Israel, with some exceptions that a peace treaty has been made the last couple of years. But this is not the way the modern Jewish state seems to fit. So these are three passages where the second perspective would say, we agree with the first perspective, the modern Jewish state is an accent of history. However, we disagree with the first view that these prophecies are not to be interpreted allegorically, but literally, and will someday be literally fulfilled. Then we have a third perspective. The third perspective but, uh, understands that there are two different types of worldwide regatherings. First of all, a worldwide regathering in unbelief and preparation for judgment, followed by a worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for blessing. But then they go on to say that the modern Jewish state is the beginnings of the fulfillment of the final worldwide regathering and bringing the Jewish people back into the land. Somewhere in the process, there'll be a national salvation, they're not sure just when, but what we're seeing now is really merely the beginnings of the final restoration. And therefore, we should anticipate a national salvation, anticipate a second coming, and all of the prophecies concerning these elements. Now, the, um, when you bring up the question, what about the um, tribulation that the Bible prophesied? And the response now is that the Nazi Holocaust fulfilled all of the tribulation prophecies. So there is no future Holocaust coming. And therefore, every Jew needs to return. An emissary came back to one of the congregations we started by in St. Petersburg, Russia. They came in and said, it's nice to believe in Jesus, but that's not uh, the totality of salvation because every Jew should now pack up and move to Israel and begin to live in Israel. Otherwise, there will be a judgment coming. And one of the members of this movement came to the congregation I was a member of and I was still living in California, saying every Jewish member in this congregation needs to pack up quickly and move to Israel. And when the elders asked him for um, biblical verification, he went to Jeremiah and mentioned how Jeremiah called upon the Jewish people to leave where they are and move to Israel. And when the elders pointed out, but Jeremiah was focusing on Babylon, and his answer was, well, when Jeremiah said Babylon, that was just his symbolic usage of the USA. <laughs> and therefore, especially here in America, which has the largest Jewish population, they must move into Israel. Mm -hmm. And when they also mentioned, well, Jeremiah mentions the Euphrates River. Ah, and, ah, his, ah. and his answer was, when Jeremiah said that, that the Euphrates River, that was simply his symbol for the Mississippi River in the <laughs> USA. And so what we are now seeing is the beginnings of the final restoration, and all Jews must now return. So go down to Roman 2 on your outline. But before we do that, capital B under Roman number 1. What people need to recognize, the Bible speaks of two different worldwide regatherings. First of all, a worldwide regathering in unbelief, in preparation for judgment, the judgment of the tribulation. And eventually, when the tribulation comes, they'll bring about Israel's national salvation, and then there'll be a second worldwide regathering faith in preparation for blessing. Now, the passages we just read speak of the final worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for blessing. So how is that relevant to our present topic on the modern Jewish state? Now, here let's bring in the third, the, um, uh, fourth perspective. 
The fourth perspective recognizes these two different worldwide regatherings, one in unbelief and one is faith. So far, so good. But they go on to say, we cannot really be sure if the modern Jewish state fulfills the prophecies about a worldwide regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment, and why not? They claim that you can have a worldwide regathering in unbelief followed by dispersion, another regathering in unbelief followed by dispersion, and even another regathering followed by dispersion before you have the specific one that the Bible talks about. And that's what, that's what Isaiah will show us cannot be. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. What we're doing so far is dealing with three plus one plus three. The first three dealt with the prophecies of a worldwide regathering in faith. The plus one will deal with the misconception that you can have more than one worldwide regathering in unbelief before you have the one that fulfills prophecy. Now the, the, the full context is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, to chapter 12, verse 6. And we're going to be concerned about what's said in chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. It shall come to pass in that day, the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamat and from the islands of the sea. And he will cast up an ensign for the nations and all and will assemble all of the outcasts of Israel and Gatiga, dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now this whole context deals with the final regathering in faith in preparation for the blessing, the blessings of the Messianic kingdom. So is this relevant specifically to what our topic is? He, notice how he numbers the final worldwide regathering in faith, in preparation for blessing. He calls it the second one. If the last one is the second one, how many more can you have before that one? <laughs> Even with new math, only one. <laughs> in other words, the Bible only allows for two worldwide regatherings and not more than that. First of all, a worldwide regathering in unbelief, in preparation for judgment. And then we'll have uh, an only after that we'll see a regathering in faith in preparation for the blessings of the kingdom. And so there can only be two worldwide regatherings. So let's now go to the last plus three. We look at three passages that speak of a different worldwide regathering, a regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. We'll begin with Ezekiel chapter 20. Okay, we'll look at Ezekiel chapter 20. We'll start with verse 33. 20:33. As thou live, says the Lord Jehovah, surely with a mighty hand, with not stretched arm, and wrath put out, will I be king over you. And I'll bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered, with a mighty hand, with not stretched upper arm, with wrath put out, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and they will enter judgment with you face to face. Like as entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I enter the judgment with you, says the Lord Jehovah, and I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge out from among you and them that, per, 
and them that transgress against me. I'll bring them forth out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter in the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am Jehovah. Now in these verses, Ezekiel goes back to the Exodus experience under Moses. And he points out that under Moses, God brought Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. And God's plan and program for Israel in the Sinai was to receive more details about the Mosaic law, but also to build the tabernacle to which much of the law could then be maintained. And with these two things accomplished, which took approximately one year, they were to press on and enter into the Promised Land. Because of a series of memorings and rebellions against the revealed will of God, God entered into judgment with the Exodus generation. They will now have to continue wandering in the Sinai till 40 years pass. In that 40 year period, there was, there'll be the whole nation that came out of Egypt from the age of 20 outward will pass away, only two men surviving. And therefore, the, the, Sinai, the Exodus generation fell under the judgment and did not enter into the promised land until 40 years pass. And then there was a new generation, the wilderness generation, that came into being, that finally accepted the offer and went into the promised land under Joshua. But you see, uh, notice, a worldwide regathering to land in general, a worldwide regathering in unbelief, in preparation for the judgment of the tribulation. Now this picture is a regathering to the land in general, but skip over to chapter 22, which is more focused on a regathering in the city of Jerusalem. Ezekiel chapter 22 and look at verse 17. And the word of Jehovah came unto me saying, Son of man, the house of Israel's become dross unto me. All of them are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace, and they are the dross of silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, because you're all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin in the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in my anger, in my wrath, and I will lay you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and you shall know that I, Jehovah, have poured out my wrath upon you. Focusing upon Jerusalem, he pictures Jerusalem becoming a furnace of fire, a furnace of affliction. And notice again describing a regathering in unbelief because they're filled with the impurities of, of lead and tin and iron and so on. And eventually the fires of God's wrath will come upon them, causing a purging and before they come to their national salvation. And so Jerusalem becoming a furnace of affliction uses a need for refining. And some other examples I'll give you, you can just mark these verses down. Three passages in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one, verse 22, Isaiah 122, also verse 25, verse 25, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, Isaiah 48, verse 10, Jeremiah chapter six, verses 27 through 30, Jeremiah six, 27 through 30, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 7. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. Zechariah 13, verse 9. And one more. I often assume this is an Italian prophet because they mispronounce his name as Malachi. <laughs> it's Malachi in Hebrew Malachi. Chapter three, verses two and three. Chapter three, verses two and three. But notice he describes in this passage a regathering in unbelief, because they're filled with the impurities of uh, brass and iron, lead and tin. And the purpose of the regathering is, is for a time of wrath, 
our time of wrath, thou finally bring them a, to a national salvation. And that will in turn lead to the second coming and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. <coughs> Let's go to the second of the last stream. Let's turn to the minor prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah. In Zephaniah chapter 1, he details some of the elements of what he calls the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. That is the most common biblical name for we now choose to call the tribulation, the great tribulation. So again, the most common name is tribulation, great tribulation, but the most common biblical title is the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord. And chapter 1 describes what a terrible time that will be for the Jewish people at that future time. But now look at chapter 2, verse 1. Notice the word before, specifically before the day of Jehovah arrives. Chapter 2, verse 1, Get yourselves together, ye gather together a nation that has no shame. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of Jehovah come upon you, before the day of Jehovah's anger come upon you. So notice before the day of Jehovah arrives, before the tribulation period even starts, there's going to be a time in which God will bring them through a serious tribulation into the day of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord that will bring them to national salvation. And, uh, and while the rapture of the church has no prerequisites whatsoever, it's an event that can happen any moment of time, even today. However, the second coming is God's program for Israel. It does have a key prerequisite, Israel's national salvation. Another passage you can mark down, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 22 through 24. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 24. But what we see so far is that the Bible allows only for two worldwide regatherings and no more than two. So what we see with the present Jewish state is a fulfillment of those prophecies that speak of a worldwide regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. And that's in preparation for the tribulation that will bring them to national salvation, which will then fulfill the second prerequisite for the second the the prerequisite for the second coming, which is Israel's national salvation. Let's move on to the last segment, the corollary evidence, the at the final plus three. I'm going to read four passages in sequence that are, that are on your outline, and then I'll make my comments accordingly. Let's begin with Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, we have Daniel's famous prophecy of the 77s, or the 490 of period God has decreed over the Jewish people. It goes beyond our purpose to go through the whole passage phrase by phrase. If you've done this on your own or will do it on your own, here's what you learn. The first 483 years of this 490-year period has been fulfilled historically, ending with the first coming of the Messiah. However, there's still seven years left to run of this prophetic time clock of Israel. And therefore, the question we have to raise now is, what will be the one single event that will begin the last seven years taking away? Which brings us to verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9. And he shall make a firm covenant with many 
for one seven. The pronoun he goes back to its nearest antecedent, which is found in verse 26 as the prince that shall come. In other words, the prince that shall come in verse 26, and the he who makes a covenant with Israel in verse 27 is the one and the same individual, but known our circles is simply as the Antichrist. So last seven years of this prophetic time clock of Israel will only begin with the signing of this covenant. It's not the rapture of the church that will start the tribulation. The rapture will come sometime before the tribulation. And the rapture is God's program for the body of the Messiah, the church, the bride of the Messiah, the church. And there's no prerequisite. It can happen any moment of time. People often talk about the signs of the rapture. The sign, there are no signs for the rapture. It can happen any time. Right. But we're dealing here with the second coming, and that does have a prerequisite. So verse 27, for that to be fulfilled requires two things to be in place. Number one, there has to be a Jewish state with a Jewish government with whom a covenant like this could be signed. And this has not been in place as of 1948. But secondly, this requires the Antichrist to already be in high political authority with whom a sovereign state like Israel could sign a covenant of this nature and this is not yet in place. But the event that will trigger will be the signing of this covenant. Now let's look at the issue of the third temple. I'm going to read the four passages on your outline and then I'll make my observations. And he shall make a firm covenant of many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will cause the sacrifice in the and the ablation to cease. And upon the wing of abomination shall come one that makes desolate, and even unto the full end, and that determined shall wrath be put out upon the desolate. The second passage will be Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Matthew chapter 24, we'll read verses 15 and 16. When therefore you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let him that reads understand, then let them that are in Judea flee unto the mountains. Now the third passage will be 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thess chapter 2. Second Thess chapter two, we'll read verses three and four. Second Thess two, verses three and four. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be except the falling away come first, and the son and the man of sin be revealed, the sin of perdition, he that opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. The last passage will be Revelation 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, verse one and two. Revelation 11, verse one. And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod. And one said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. And the court which is outside the temple, leave without and measure it not. For it has been given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. 
All of four of these passages are referring to an event that's called the Abomination of Desolation. It's an event that will take place at the midpoint of the seven years of tribulation. At that midpoint, the Antichrist will break his treaty with Israel, guaranteeing Israel with military security, but that covenant is now broken. He will then take over the Jewish temple, cause a forced cessation of the sacrificial system, which was re-inaugurated before the midpoint of the tribulation. And then he'll call upon the whole world to worship him as God and to signify their acceptance of his deity by taking the mark of 666. <coughs> now that event takes place in the midpoint of the tribulation, so what we know is for sure the temple has been rebuilt and already functioning before the midpoint of the tribulation. That means the temple has to be rebuilt before the midpoint. That gives us only two options. It might be rebuilt before the tribulation starts or it might be rebuilt even in the first half of the tribulation. We cannot make it more specific than that one issue. But the midpoint, it is standing and functioning, so it'll be rebuilt either during the first half or it may be rebuilt even before the tribulation starts. Now, as far as the timing, it has, this, ha, this could not happen before, uh, it could not happen before 1948, but it could not happen before 1967, because in 1967 is when the Six Day War broke out. And from 48 to 67, Israel had the west side of the city under their sovereignty, but the old city, and the temple compound was under Jordanian sovereignty for 19 years. But the Six Day War, Israel conquered what was called, what was called the West Bank, and Israel took over the um, temple compound. Only now is it possible to rebuild the temple. The temple is not yet up going at this stage. But there, there are two things that we should point out. There is the Temple Institute that has been making all of the different furnishings for the, for the temple. And they've already constructed everything they need, but they cannot put everything in the temple because they've not been given the permit from the government to go ahead and construct the Jewish temple. So Israel is, is in control of the temple compounds under their sovereignty as far as politics are concerned, but as far as religion, it is still given over to Muslim territory. But the Six Day War did fulfill that the old city now falls under Israeli sovereignty. Another group called the Atarat HaKohanim. Most Jewish people today do not know what tribe they're from. I do not know what tribe I'm from. Some of my friends uh, have guessed that I belong to an ancient Jewish Indian tribe called the Shmohawks. <laughs> I, I don't buy that. But the one tribe that kept their identity is the tribe of Levi because it was important through a rabbinic organization, but the role of the tribes have no relevance to the temple, but the tribe of Levi is the issue for the temple to be constructed. And so Jewish people named Levi, Levine, Levinson, Leventhal, or something similar to that, all members of the tribe of Levi, but not all Levites could be priests. To be a priest, you have to be a direct descendant of Aaron. So Jewish people named Cohen, sometimes spelled K-O-H-E-N or C-O-H-E-N, or something similar, that's the Hebrew word for priest. And what they've done is they've chosen Orthodox Jewish people who are of the Cohen line to begin training them to do the proper sacrifices. So once the temple's rebuilt, they can immediately fun being, have functioning priests to be able to do so. Now raises two questions about the two things. Point three in your outline, the Ark of the Covenant. The assumption is that the temple cannot function except 
for the Ark of the Covenant and therefore they need to find the Ark of the Covenant. Now Jewish groups are now looking for the, for the Ark of the Covenant, but certain Christian groups do. Let's keep in mind the, the Ark of the Covenant did not survive the Babylonian destruction in, at the first temple. And when God commanded them to rebuild the second temple, there were a number of things missing, one of which was there was no Ark of the Covenant. Yet for six centuries, the Ark of the Covenant um, was, was not available, and yet the temple functioned and the blood was sprinkled upon a foundation stone from the Solomonic Temple that was put into the Holy of Holies, and that's where the blood was sprinkled. And what all this shows that we do not need to recover the Ark of the Covenant for the temple to be, to be able to function. And we know that the Millennial Temple will not have an Ark of the Covenant either. And that's spelled out in Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, Jeremiah 3, 11 through 18. And now we have the question about the ashes of the red heifer. The laws of the red heifer are spelled out in the book of Numbers chapter 19. Book of Numbers chapter 19. And by the mosaic law, it has to be primarily a reddish brown cow. But rabbinic Judaism made it more stringent. And by Pharisaic specifically, Pharisaic Judaism, the red heifer cannot have more than two black hairs or two white hairs. And so far, they haven't had a perfect red heifer. However, there was a Texan rancher who was a cattle rancher. He had several perfect red heifers with no white hairs and no black hairs. So he shipped those to Israel, but that, that did not solve the problem because another issue of rabbinic Pharisaic law is for the red heifer to be kosher, it must be born in Israel. It cannot be born in Texas. <laughs> It has to be a Jewish cow. It cannot be a Gentile cow. <laughs> <laughs> so what they've been doing with the red heifers he sent them is generic engineering to try to produce the perfect red heifer. So far, it has not been successful. But ultimately, they'll be able to have a successful red heifer. And the red heifer is not a normal sacrifice. It was killed away from the temple compound, usually at the Mount of Olives. And then the um, red heifer was used for the cleansing of the priesthood to make him ceremonially clean, all ritual clean cleanness, before they can function in the priesthood. So these are the, uh, the things that they are still dealing with at the present time. Okay, let's deal with the last point, and let's turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, all the way through chapter 39, verse 16. That's where the context ends. Verse 17 begins a new context. He deals with an alliance of nations headed up by Magog. Magog, Magog is the ter that was once the territory, as it's not called anymore, but it's the territory between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It's modern day southern Russia today. It's right between two seas, the Black Sea on the east and the, uh, uh, on the west and the Caspian Sea on the east. The word Gog is not a name. It's the title of the king of Magog in the same way as Pharaoh is not a name. It's the title of the king of Egypt. Kaiser is not a name. The title of the king of Germany. Tsar is not a name. It's the title of the king of Russia and so on. So that's what Gog is, looking for that would be a leader from the territory of what is now in uh, South Russia. There'll be other alliances that he mentions in verses one through um, six. We're not gonna go to the details that goes beyond the scope of what we're trying to do. But let's look at the specific verses. Look at verse eight, chapter 38, verse eight. After many days you shall be visited. In the latter years you shall come into land that's brought back from the sword that's gathered out of many peoples upon the mountains of Israel. 
which have been a continual waste, but it is brought forth out of the peoples, and they shall dwell securely, all of them. Skipping down to verse 12. To take the spoil and to take the prey, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, against the people that are gathered out of the nations, and they've gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the middle of the earth. What, we, what he describes is Israel's regathered state in unbelief. Regathered as after escaping a worldwide uh, sword, which was the Nazi Holocaust. And now they've been rebuilding the wasted cities that have been uh, uh, wasted for many centuries. They're regathered out of wrath and unbelief. And therefore, this invasion is not a prophecy that could be recorded in ancient times as a fulfillment. It was not fulfilled in ancient times. It is only be fulfilled after 48, after it has been reconstituted as a regathered nation, though in unbelief. And so this invasion could only happen after 1948. And as you continue reading to chapter 38, you notice that the enemy will penetrate Israeli defenses. They'll enter into the central mountain range. But now look at chapter 39, verse 2. Chapter 39, verse 2. And I will turn you about and will lead you on and will cause you to come up from the uttermost parts of the north and I'll bring you upon the mountains of Israel. Verse 4, you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel is the central mountain range. It begins at the south end of the Galilee, the south end of the Jezreel Valley. It runs the whole length of the center of the country and finally peters out just north of the city of Beersheba. Now in these mountains are many of the famous biblical cities such as Dothan, Shechem, Samaria, Shiloh, Bethel, Ai, Rama, Bethlehem, Hebron, Debir, and the most important, Jerusalem. And this is the target of the invading army. And so this, uh, so this invasion not only could not happen before 1948, it could not happen before 1967. Only in the 1967 Six Day War, that the land, that the um, temple compound, and so on, fall under Israeli sovereignty. So this is also another invasion that's going to happen in the future. We don't know when. However, things are already happening in preparation for it. So to draw some conclusions, number one, is not a fulfillment of those prophecies we first read of a worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for blessing. But this is a fulfillment, secondly, of the prophecies that spoke of a worldwide regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. Now, as we're seeing these prophecies slowly moving into fulfillment, we're not given any dates. We're given an order of events but not given any specific dates. So Israel became a state in 1948. That was a fulfillment of prophecy, but they did not have Jerusalem until 1967. So now we know there was that 19 year break between 48 and 67. So we don't have time, we have uh, nine events that will lead up to the tribulation. We don't have the details of how many years will transpire between this and that. But once we see how things are being fulfilled, God is in control, that should give us some uh, spiritual element, and that should give us some fulfillment in the personal sense, because our blessed hope is not, who's the Antichrist? No. Who is this guy? Who is that guy? When is the Gog and Magog war taking place? Our blessed hope is when he will rise, the Messiah rise from the right hand of God, return to this earth's atmosphere, and the dead in Messiah, 
of the church will be resurrected and those believing will suddenly be caught up. That's what the word rapture means, to suddenly be caught up. And that is our blessed hope. And that's what we should be looking for. Though there may be other prophecies fulfilled, there may be no more prophecies to be filled, we just don't know, because the rapture could come even today. But that is our blessed hope. <laughs> Sila. We'll take questions on all this later. We'll have, have another study, and then uh, the second study from me on the Arab states and prophecy.